environmental protection is more than just a buzzword. It encompasses how we conserve resources, reduce our carbon footprint, and also how it helps communities thrive. Today, we'll take a look at how ecological solutions can improve people's lives as well as protect the natural world. Hello and welcome to a new edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Kahomza Twinobio, coming to you from Kampala, right here in Uganda. Hello, Sandra. You are so right. Protecting our planet from the many threats it faces is how we can make sure it is livable for us and future generations. I am Chris Alems, joining you from Lagos. Here is what is coming up. How people in Crete are trying to turn the tide on a beautiful but dangerous fish species. And why a restaurant owner in Kenya has set up a crab hatchery. But first we head to Zimbabwe where access to electricity remains a challenge for roughly 50% of the population. In fact, that figure is as low as 30% in rural areas. This energy poverty is especially harmful to children's education. One young engineering student came up with a clever idea to help light up the night. And it's a win-win solution. Even after nightfall, these young people in the rural community of Mahusekwa, some 70 kilometers southeast of Zimbabwe's capital Harare, do not have to put their books away. That's thanks to these solar-powered lights that are made from recycled materials. In Zimbabwe, roughly 70% of the rural population have no access to electricity. The only lights that used to be available here came from kerosene lamps. 25-year-old Aluwain Mayonga is an electrical engineering graduate, an inventor of what he calls the Chigubu lantern. Chigubu roughly translates as a plastic container. At home we had a lot of uh, solar, solar LED lights that were no longer functioning. In the term, I think I was doing some basics of electronics at school. So I figured out that I could be able to fix these lights. The challenge that I faced that term was the challenge of the casing. So that's when I thought maybe I could just put this, uh, the light that I had fixed in a plastic waste bottle. Using discarded plastic bottles, Mayonga has now made more than 500 lanterns, which he's mainly distributed in rural communities. They not only help young people their study, they contribute to a circular economy. The Jukub Lantern innovation uh, is tackling the problem of plastic waste, which is uh, contributing significantly to climate, uh, to climate change. So by addressing this problem, uh, we are reusing plastic waste, hence we are reducing the amount of waste that is reaching our dam size. Then at the same time, the lanterns are charged using solar power, which is a green source of energy. <laughs> Zimbabwe generates about 1.9 million tons of waste annually. Nearly 20% of that is plastics. Environmentalists have welcomed innovations like the Chigubu Lantern that address the country's plastic waste crisis. Putting huge piles of plastic waste across cities in Zimbabwe, which are, uh, cities are failing to contain. In that regard, recycling uh, this plastic waste to feed into the Chigubu innovation is a noble idea, which of course would need more support, thereby addressing the environmental degradation aspects in keeping the environment clean, but also the energy aspect in deployment too, which is our three main crises that we're facing here in our country. To maximize the impact of his invention, Aluwain Mayonga is teaching young people how to build their own lanterns. The elementary school he's visiting today is completely off-grid. I believe in educating these young people because they are the future. If they are more knowledgeable on how best they can solve uh, the problem of plastic waste, I think our future will be more sustainable. The young inventor has also installed a solar system at the school which allows the students to charge their lanterns during the day. 
I'm excited about making Chigubu lantern as it is teaching us on how to keep the environment clean. According to the school authorities, the students' grades have improved now that they can keep studying after dark. This has actually motivated our children to do their studies well because they are able to do their homework at, at home and also do their studies using, using the lights. They go and use the light at night and tomorrow morning when they come back to school they bring the light with them and it is charged and then in the evening when they return home they go with their light. So we are essentially culturing a sustainable mindset in them so that when they grow up, they know what's right to do for the environment, what's right to do for the climate, uh, for the planet, and that will help us in our fight against climate change. Aluwain Mayonga's aim is to bring light to more communities without access to electricity. In the long run, he hopes to set up a factory to manufacture the affordable lighting solution on a larger scale. This week's Eco Hero not only gives workshops on solar power, she also runs our own small business. Everyone calls her the Solar Queen. But watch out, our enthusiasm is contagious. Jumoke Adepoju isn't easily daunted. The 27 year old installs solar systems, like here on a house in Shagamu, in Ogun State, Nigeria. She's an expert in solar energy and the only woman on the team. I wouldn't say it's easy, neither would I say it's difficult. Going to the climbing roof, putting panels on them, like it's not all that easy, but then I think determination and if you love what you do, you'll be able to you know, surmount all these little, little challenges. Her boss and mentor is Damilola Ashale known as the Solar Queen. She founded her solar tech company back in 2007 when only a few were betting on renewable energies. Back then, she had to convince her customers that her technology, as well as her expertise, were reliable. When I started the company, I always get the question, do you know what you're saying? Can I speak to the man in charge? Are you sure you, you can answer my technical questions? All these biases and statements made me want to actually do more. Damilola Ashale was determined to fight this kind of prejudice and attract more women to the sector. In 2017, she founded the Ashdam Academy for Solar Technology, but it was mostly men who signed up for the courses. We sat down and thought, how can we encourage more women to apply for the training? And this was actually what, what brought about the Solar Queen Scholarship. And with that, we've been able to actually sometimes offer 100% scholarship to women. A scholarship for women was the answer. She was able to recruit NGOs, companies and the German Development Agency as sponsors. Solar Queen scholarship winners are between 19 and 29 years old and many have no previous experience. Over the course of three months, the participants learn to install and maintain photovoltaic systems. At the end, they receive a certificate, their ticket to a new job. So I want to disconnect this. We need to close the gender gap in the renewable energy space. We need to close the gender gap in the technical space. And we need to have highly skilled women also um, operating in these roles. For example, Mercy Olabiron and Mary Ayeni at the company Zoom Logitech. Mercy used to work in sales for the company and Mary was a makeup artist. Quite a leap. It's a male-dominated sector, but the world is talking about gender equality now. And I want to encourage ladies out there coming to solar panel installation that they can do what a male can do. Today they are installing a solar system for a hotel in Oyo town. The hotel used to be connected to the public power grid. Since four days now, there's no power supply. And you know, if they want to run this kind of business, we have to have another ways to power supply. Today we are installing a 5 kVA solar panel system. So far, around 250 women have completed the Solar Queen training. More than 9,000 have taken part in training courses and seminars on solar technology. We need even more, says Damilola. 
The potential for solar energy in Nigeria is huge, but the switch to photovoltaic systems is difficult, not only because of money, but also due to a lack of skilled workers. In Nigeria, we have about 60% of us without living without access to energy, and that 60%, maybe about 90 million people. The problems um, can be solved within one day. The problems can be solved by one person. And that's why Damilola Ashaleye is hoping for more women like Jumoke Adikboju. Her former student takes women from the Solar Queen program along to work with her. Today they are equipping a kiosk in Ibadan with a mini solar power system. For Adikboju, it's a routine assignment, but for her student, it's a milestone. Getting solar energy to light up the darkness. Now let's switch continent and head to Vienna, Austria, where energy efficiency is the name of the game. But here it takes a very different shape. Vienna is building a new and future-proof district. In the second installment of our new series, our social media team checks out the high-tech ways the district plans to save energy. These smart buildings talk to each other. In Vienna's newest district, communication is key. The buildings are producing solar energy in a connected setup. If one building needs more power, the others can provide it. This smart building is equipped with thousands of sensors. So researchers can study how buildings can efficiently share power. Buildings consume about 40% of global energy. So making them more efficient can make a real difference. Good. Time now to leave West Africa and head to the coast of South Africa. Shark fins are considered a delicacy in some parts of the world. And the illegal global trade is booming, shrinking shark populations. To combat smuggling, an anti-poaching organization came up with an unconventional prevention method. This week on Doing a Bit. Sharks have lived on Earth for more than 450 million years, and yet many species are now seriously endangered because every year more than 70 million of them are caught. Asia is the main market for their fins, a popular and expensive delicacy. The market is worth more than 400 million euros. Each species of shark can be identified by its fins, something the Wildlife Protection Organization Traffic is making use of in its fight against poaching. In South Africa, employees scan in real shark fins. That allows the computer to create exact 3D models of them. The 3D printer then builds a copy. And that's when the artistic part of the job begins. Shark fins are not only different in shape. Each species has its own typical coloring, which makes it unique. All the details are included. The aim of these 3D printed models is to enable anyone to identify a shark species using them. Customs officials can use them and can essentially help stop any illegal fins being smuggled through their borders. It's a big gap in the illegal shark trade and a lot of these fins are going through our borders undetected. This tool can really help in stopping that. Each artificial fin is also accorded a QR code. This gives customs officials more information about the particular species, allowing them to respond immediately if they find fins from protected sharks. Threatened marine species such as sharks need to be protected and the more people know about them, the better. What they look like, what they need to survive and also where they belong. Because increasingly, we are seeing species spreading in places where they don't belong. As the oceans grow warmer, non-native species are moving in. Take lionfish, for example. In recent years, 
They've swam halfway around the world and have now reached the Mediterranean. In Crete, they are causing all sorts of problems. When you open its mouth, it's full. It's a huge problem. They eat the young fish and all the smaller fish. A few years ago, here near the eastern coast of Crete, lionfish were just a bycatch. Now, the nets are full of them, especially in early summer. Today's catch isn't particularly good, but the crew did net plenty of lionfish. One is trapped. The spiny fish are venomous, so the fisher has to be careful. These here are the venomous spikes. The venom is similar to that of the scorpion fish, except it's more poisonous. So we have to be pretty careful. Fortunately, the fish are edible. Lionfish may be lovely to look at, but they're among the most invasive species in the world. They arrived here through the Suez Canal and are thriving in the waters that have grown warmer as a result of climate change. Researchers say that encouraging local fishers to catch them and control their population would help. And lionfish are tasty, but they haven't caught on with consumers yet. The port of Aios Nikolaos is just a few kilometers away. It's home to one of the few seafood shops that sell lionfish here. Shop owner Grigoris Kokolakis decided to take the plunge four years ago. Today, his employees know how to remove the venomous spines and fillet the fish. But so far, customers haven't quite warmed up to them. I have to promote it because uh, people don't know it. Um, after the experts told us that um, it was okay to eat, we tasted it. It had a, you know, a good, good taste, good flavor, and the fish is white inside. Efforts are underway to grow the market for lionfish, like this publicity event in the southeast of Crete. Local chefs, hotel and restaurant owners were invited to sample various dishes made with lionfish fillets. It's a competitive industry, but here the participants can share ideas for recipes and learn how to better market the fish. Just as important, though, is that the organizers want to raise awareness of the ecological benefits of eating lionfish. Our main purpose is to reduce the damage that the lionfish is doing to the ecosystem. So we find out that uh, we can uh, promote it with different recipes, so we say, why not? About 900 kilometers north in Thessaloniki, we visit the headquarters of IC, an independent environmental organization that promotes sustainable fishing. They're also looking for solutions for invasive species like the lionfish. In a pilot project, they're testing a special trap. The reason why we're using these traps is because they have less bycats. So they mostly target, like they attract mostly lionfish uh, and not uh, native species. Because lionfish are usually attracted by steady constructions. When the lionfish gather around the artificial reef, the trap snaps shut. The trap was patented in the United States. Now, the first fishers have started testing a smaller and lighter version in the Mediterranean. IC also works with scientists. Marine biologist Stelios Katsanevakis explains why lionfish have become such a plague here. It entered the Mediterranean Sea through the Suez Canal, uh, as many hundreds of uh, other species. So, especially the Eastern Mediterranean is now quite invaded by many tropical species from the Red Sea. This new environment with climate change is much more suitable to their environmental preferences. When the Suez Canal was opened, and uh, for the following decades, there were many obstacles for uh, the Sepsian species uh, to arrive in the Mediterranean. Uh, one of these obstacles were the salt lakes. Gradually, the salinity was reduced, and now the salinity in this region is uh, very similar to the salinity in the Red Sea. Now, species from the Red Sea have essentially no obstacles to arrive to the Mediterranean. Back in Crete, a batch of fresh lionfish fillets have just been delivered. It's a specialty here, 
one of the few places that has linefish on the menu. We offer two different dishes with recipes created by our chef. They include tarama and skodalia garlic dip along with various herbs. They're some of the most popular dishes on our menu. Whether local or tourist, everyone who tries the dishes is won over. This visitor from Poland had never heard of lionfish before. This is my first time and I am very, very impressed. Uh, this fish is delicious. The boats have headed back out again. The more the lionfish market continues to grow, the better for local fishers and the marine ecosystem. And now for another delicacy from the sea, edible crabs. The global appetite for crabs from Kenya is huge. Every month, around 10,000 tons are caught there and exported around the world. But demand is so big that now crab populations are under threat and so are their habitats. So, is there a way to farm them sustainably? We paid a visit to a project striving to do just that. Whenever the tide is low, Saidi Guyo is out here hunting for mud crabs at the Maida Creek in Watamu Kilifi County. It has been his daily routine for the past 30 years. He used to catch about 10 crabs a day, but due to overfishing, on a good day he's glad to find five. This time, he'll have to make do with just one. These low yields are the result of climate change. And that's where most of the problems lie. The dry season is now much longer than it used to be, and crabs prefer rainy weather. Most of Saidi Guyo's catch ends up in restaurants, like the Che Shale, which is renowned for its crab. Justin Anir has been in charge here since 1999. Over the years, he noticed that the crabs sold to his restaurant were declining in both size and number. So he started looking into breeding them. What I noticed is that um, a lot of the mangrove areas and crab areas where they have these crabs that are growing naturally were depleted. There was no more crab in these areas. And uh, even though you had very big farms for crab, but there was no more crab. Crabs and mangrove forests share a symbiotic relationship. When disrupted, it can have adverse ecological effects. Crabs live and breed in the mangroves. While digging their burrows, they help to aerate the sediment. They also feed on mangrove leaves and other organic matter, which means the nutrients get recycled. The crabs are very good in terms of the ecological monitoring because they tell you if a mangrove is completely degraded, you will not find the crabs there. So they are an indicator of the mangrove environment. To help boost the dwindling crab stocks, Justin Anir decided to set up a hatchery in 2017. Most of the world's hatcheries are found in Asia. Anir's hatchery is one of the first to be established on the African continent. To make sure the program succeeds, he holds training sessions at his hatchery for local farmers. They're learning the importance of conserving the mud crab and about their symbiotic relationship with the mangrove forests. Once the program starts, they'll purchase baby crabs instead of fishing in the nearby creeks. Justin Anir's hatchery will sell a kilo of eggs to the farmers at about 2 euros 30. Once they mature into crabs, the farmers will release some into the mangrove forests and sell some of them to restaurants. And wastewater from the hatchery can also be used to help regenerate the mangrove forests. I collect a mangrove seed that washes up on our beach here, put them in this mud and that wastewater, because it is full of, of, uh, of uh, good stuff for mangroves, but bad stuff for crabs. The mangroves thrive from the bad stuff from crabs. Justin Anir's hatchery at Che Shale may not single-handedly solve the issues of overfishing or mangrove conservation on the Kenyan coast. 
but it's certainly one step in the right direction. That's all for this edition of Eco Africa. I hope you liked the show. Join us next week when we'll take a look at more environment initiatives and the people behind them. I am Sandra Kahumza Twinovio saying goodbye from Kampala, right here in Uganda. Bye, Sandra. I also hope everyone will join us again next week. In the meantime, all the best from me, Chris Alems, signing off from Lagos, Nigeria. Take care and see you soon. Oh.